Welcome or welcome back to the future of. This is the space for those curious about the future. I tell you about the technologies, strokes of genius, and discontinuities that could become big and shape the way we live tomorrow. In this episode, I take you from the bottom of the oceans to the moon. I promise, with stories that are perhaps some of the best ever told at the future of. One. CO2 capture. How it works, how much, and what those who advocate actively removing carbon dioxide from the air hope to achieve. Two. Lunar Noah's Arkansas. An American scientist plans a base on the moon to preserve traces of Earth's living things in case the planet is destroyed. Three. Immortal microbes. A team of Japanese scientists drills the sea floor and discovers bacteria that are 100 million years old. And that's not the only surprise, they are alive. 4. Organ Bioprinting From the university at Buffalo comes technology that prints organs in minutes. Where do we stand on 3D bioprinting? 5. Miracle Sand Did you know we're running out of sand? I'll tell you how this isn't a joke, but a very underrated environmental issue. Are you ready? Then hold on tight. Buckle up, ready to go. Silence, please. The capture of CO2. The capture of carbon dioxide from the air is considered one of the possible strategies to reduce its concentration and help humanity in the fight against climate change. For others, it is simply a wrong approach because they argue that the real battle is not to directly reduce the excess CO2 already in the air, but to avoid producing more. Indeed, if we had the technologies to do all this, they would become an alibi, capable of slowing down the adoption of virtuous behaviors. But what do we mean when we talk about capturing carbon dioxide from the air? How does it work? How much does it cost? Is it true that in 2050 the planet Earth will be dotted with mega-facilities scattered everywhere intended precisely for this purpose? They are called direct air capture plants, better known as DACs, and to look at them they look like giant air conditioners of incredible proportions. And in a way, that's exactly what they are. What they do is try to cool the planet by sucking carbon dioxide out of the air. They've gone alongside other passive strategies that were already in use, but decidedly less efficient. Today, most carbon capture, for example, focuses on limiting emissions at the source, scrubbers and filters on smokestacks that prevent harmful gases from reaching the atmosphere. Obviously if you have a smokestack it makes sense, but if you think about your car and the billions of cars on the road, this solution is expensive and impractical. Not to mention that this approach, cannot address the CO2 that is already in the air. And that's where direct air capture comes in. Technically speaking, the system works cleanly and simply. The system uses fans to pass air containing 0.04% CO2, the current atmospheric levels, through a filter soaked in a solution of potassium hydroxide, a caustic chemical commonly known as potash, used in soap making and various other applications. The potash absorbs CO2 from the air, after which the liquid is piped into a second chamber and mixed with calcium hydroxide, a building lime. The lime takes up the dissolved CO2, producing small limestone flakes. These limestone flakes are then sieved and heated in a third chamber, called a calciner, until they decompose, releasing pure CO2, which is captured and stored. The good thing is that at each stage, The leftover chemicals are recycled back into the process, forming a closed reaction that repeats itself indefinitely, with no waste materials. But how many such plants would it take to make an impact? The scale of the carbon removal challenge using technologies like DAX, rather than plants, is huge. One authoritative study calculates that, to keep up with global CO2 emissions, which currently stand at 36 gigatons per year, would mean building about 30,000 large-scale DAC plants. To give a better idea of that number, it would mean more than three for every coal-fired power plant operating in the world today. And further, since each plant would cost about $500 million, it would require $15 trillion. Not to mention that if we had DAC plants large enough to capture 10 gigatons of CO2 each year, 
or less than a third of the target, we would need 4 million tons of potassium hydroxide, or one and a half times the entire annual global supply of this chemical. But perhaps the real problem is that there is not yet a substantial market for the carbon dioxide that is captured. Direct air capture produces a valuable commodity, thousands of tons of compressed CO2. It's also true that this can be combined with hydrogen to make a synthetic, zero-emission fuel. But that's another process and new costs. Just as it has a cost to bury such CO2 underground. And where there are more costs than gains, man is known not to be particularly quick to act. Noah's Ark Lunar University of Arizona researcher Jekin Thunga took inspiration from the biblical tale of Noah's Ark to hypothesize a high-tech solution that could preserve the future of all living species. Instead of the classic two animals for each species, his solar-powered ark on the moon would store cryogenically frozen samples of seeds, spores, sperm and eggs from 6.7 million Earth species. The project, very seriously, went on to fuel an aerospace conference paper, and the concept was dubbed a modern global insurance policy by its author. Quoting his own words, Funda said, As humans, we had a close encounter with catastrophe about 75,000 years ago, with the eruption of the Toba supervolcano, which caused a 1,000-year period of temperature cooling and, according to some, caused an estimated decline in human diversity. Because human civilization has such a large impact, if it were to collapse, this could have a negative cascading effect on the rest of the planet. Granted that the disappearance of humans is not necessarily going to have such a negative effect on the planet, the theme here is that life is not only represented by humans, but also by millions of other animal and plant life that plow the earth every day. The most informed will have immediately thought of the genome bank that is located in Svalbard, Norway and that man is feeding year after year among the cold ice of the north. The problem is that, if sea levels continue to rise, many dry places will go underwater, including Svalbard, and a facility that contains hundreds of thousands of seed samples, stored there to protect us from accidental loss of biodiversity. Thunga's team believes that storing the samples on another celestial body will reduce the risk of losing biodiversity, if an event were to cause the total annihilation of Earth. In short, theoretically, the reasoning is sound. But scientists have not limited themselves to the concept. The idea is to take advantage of underground lava channels discovered in 2013. This network of lunar lava tubes is about 100 meters in diameter. Unaltered for about 3 billion years, they could provide shelter from solar radiation, micrometeorites, and surface temperature changes. Such structures are considered as potential places to host real human lunar bases, as I have already told you in the past at the future of. But, if for humans everything is complicated by the absence of water, and the difficulty of producing breathable oxygen, on the contrary, the cryogenic storage of seeds, spores and sperm would be easier, but only in theory. Obviously, moving from theory to practice, things get more complicated. To be cryopreserved, Seeds must be cooled to minus 180 degrees, and stem cells kept at minus 196 degrees. The fact that the lava tubes are so cold, and the samples have to be even colder, means there's a risk that the metal parts of the base could freeze. But Thunga didn't give up, and designed an innovative solution. That is, the use of a cryocooled superconducting material, which is a material that transfers energy without losing heat as opposed to what a traditional cable, or material, would do. Such a material would float above a powerful magnet, with the two parts locked together at a fixed distance. Thanks to this phenomenon, the shelves of samples could float above the metal surfaces, and the temperature be perfectly maintained at the desired level. And then, it would be necessary to take the samples to the moon. Building a lunar arc is no small feat, but based on calculations, Thunga said it's not as impossible as it might seem. Transporting about 50 samples of each of the 6.7 million species would require about 250 rocket launches. 
Keep in mind that, it took 40 rocket launches to build the International Space Station. So complex yes, but impossible no. In short, we'll see if it is just one of the great projects that remain on paper, or will really be able to move to the operational phase. For now, I just think that, this is yet another sign that we are preparing to become a space civilization, although perhaps in a slightly different way from the classic colonization of distant planets by man. Immortal Microbes In 2010, Japanese scientists from the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program's expedition traveled to the South Pacific Gyre with a giant drill. The Gyre is a very peculiar place, it is a marine desert that is considered drier than all the driest places on Earth. It sounds like a joke, but it's not. Obviously, it is not arid for the lack of water, but for the lack of life. Ocean currents swirl around it, but within the area the water is still, and life struggles as few nutrients enter. Near the center are both the ocean pole of inaccessibility, made famous by the writer Lovecraft as the House of Chulhu, and the equally famous South Pacific Garbage Island. The sea here is so stingy that it takes a million years for a meter of marine snow made up of body sediment and dust to accumulate on the bottom. In other words, it's the least productive area of water on the planet. What did the scientists go to do in this inhospitable place? They lowered a drill to a depth of 6,000 meters and extracted sediments that represent the beauty of 100 million years of Earth's history. What the team wanted to know was how long and in what state the microbes trapped in the core drill could survive in this sort of oceanic refrigerator since they had been protected from radiation and cosmic rays. And what they discovered was amazing. First they realized that the sediments contained bacterial cells, a remarkable discovery, but so far pretty much in line with expectations. What they didn't expect was that when they were given food, most of the bacteria quickly revived and began to multiply. In this experiment, they revived and multiplied cells that had settled on the ocean floor when the dinosaurs walked the planet. They lasted for four geological periods, and when they were offered nourishment, they woke up and started living again, as if nothing unusual had happened. Consider that 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by marine sediments, whose microbial residents account for somewhere between one-tenth and one-half of all microbial biomass on Earth. Simply put, there are a lot of microbes down there acting like highlanders. In fact, how these photosynthetic microbes manage to reproduce in the dark after 13 million years under the seafloor remains a mystery that science now sets out to unravel. We can say that we are literally sitting on top of a planet full of living fossils that are simultaneously both fossil and living. With implications that, as a result, aren't even that clear to us. Humans live and die, dinosaurs go extinct, plants and other living things are destined to become museum fossils, but there is something that apparently never dies. With good peace even for those who want to build super technological Noah's arcs under the lunar surface. Bioprinting of organs. Sounds like science fiction. A machine plunges into a shallow basin containing translucent yellow gelatin and pulls out what becomes a hand, life size. All in just 19 minutes. On the web page of the future of, I put a link to the video that condenses the entire operation into just 7 seconds. Go watch it, because it is impressive. The hand, which would take six hours to produce using conventional 3D printing methods, demonstrates what engineers at the University at Buffalo are accomplishing. Namely, progress toward 3D printed human organs and tissues. By a technology that could possibly save countless lives, lost due to the shortage of donor organs. Just think that, in the United States alone, the list of people waiting for organs is lengthening by a new name every nine minutes. And the most pioneering thing about this technology is perhaps not even so much the speed as the ability to print entire vascular networks within the organ. Because an organ clearly is not just an outer shell or casing, but something that has to connect to the rest of the body and has a content. In fact, the researchers even 3D printed a model of a human liver that includes a vascular network. In principle, the system developed in the U.S., 
focuses on a 3D printing method called stereolithography, and gelatinous materials known as hydrogels, which are used to create diapers, contact lenses and scaffolds in tissue engineering, among other things. A solution that therefore, combines technologies already used in other fields, which allows the rapid printing of hydrogel models of quite relevant dimensions, many centimeters to be understood. It significantly reduces part deformation and cellular injury caused by prolonged exposure to environmental stresses, commonly seen in conventional 3D printing methods. After all, if you're thinking about walking into a hospital, having an organ printed and implanted, as if nothing happened, despite the advances, the reality is far from this optimistic image. So what is the state of the art? Three-dimensional bioprinting is a cutting-edge technology used to create living tissue, such as blood vessels, bone, heart, or skin, through the additive manufacturing of 3D printing. Traditional 3D printing involves producing three-dimensional solid objects from a digital file using a layering process. In its most common version, a starting material, such as plastic, is liquefied, and then the machine adds layer after layer onto the platform until you have a fully formed object. Going from a plastic to a hydrogel to living tissue, as you can imagine, is not at all trivial. While putting layers of living cells on top of each other is something that science has been achieving for over 20 years, it's not enough to have the cells because they need a nutritional environment to stay alive, such as food, water and oxygen. Gels are already a definite step forward as they are gelatin enriched with vitamins, proteins and other vital compounds. But an entire operation to create a living organ from scratch is still a goal of considerable complexity, and it will take many more years of research and development. In the meantime, however, we can expect something very interesting in a shorter time. 3D printed organs will be used to test new cosmetic, chemical, and pharmaceutical products, avoiding doing it on animals. While waiting to save lives, we can start reducing animal suffering. And that's already a good thing. The Sand of Miracles Do you know what the second most used material by humans is after water? If I had asked, the bus would have been able to answer it. And I confess, neither would I, obviously after listening to the title, you knew it was about sand. Sand is the primary substance used in the construction of roads, bridges, high-speed trains, and even land regeneration projects. Sand, gravel and rock crushed together, are melted to make the glass used in every window, computer screen and smartphone. Even the production of silicon chips uses sand. Basically, we could say we are a society built on sand. Which is incredibly scarce. The world is facing a sand shortage, and climate scientists say it constitutes one of the biggest sustainability challenges of the 21st century. But how? But weren't we told that deserts are advancing, and that desertification of large areas of the world is a substantial problem? And now instead, there is a lack of sand? The UN estimates that 4.1 billion tons of cement are produced each year, driven primarily by China which accounts for 58% of the current sand-fueled building boom. It turns out that, global use of sand and gravel is 10 times that of cement. This means that, for construction alone, the world consumes between 40 and 50 billion tons of sand per year. A volume sufficient to build a wall 27 meters high, by 27 meters wide, that wraps around the entire planet every year. A monstrous image, but it gives a good idea. The global rate of use of sand has tripled in the last two decades, in part due to the increase in urbanization, and now far exceeds the natural rate at which the sand is replenished by the erosion of rocks by wind and water. And there, ironically, lies the futility of desert sand. Desert sand grains, eroded by wind rather than water, are too smooth and rounded to bind together for construction purposes. What's more, several countries are beginning to impose restrictions on the removal of sand from coastlines, rivers and lakes, to prevent erosion and protect the landscape. So, how do we get out of this? Geneva's Global Sand Observatory Initiative, 
has identified some priorities for SAN resource governance over the next two years, cooperation on setting global standards for SAN resource use, across all sectors, research into affordable and viable alternatives to river and marine sand, updating environmental, social, and corporate governance frameworks in the financial sector to include sand, establishing regional, national, and global goals on sand use at the right scale. Yet another management and environmental challenge that you probably weren't thinking about, but instead has global significance. Thanks for listening to the future of, really. You could have listened to the radio. You could have spun a vinyl. You could have put on a cassette. You could have used a stereo 8 to know what it was but instead you preferred the future of. That's what I thank you for, and you still have hundreds of episodes left to discover. Sentence of the Week Winston Churchill wrote The longer you look back, the farther you can look forward.